Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Burlingame, Kansas, located about 30 miles south of Topeka, has a population of less than a thousand people. Though its numbers are small, Burlingame was home to a tragic and unthinkable family murder that occurred just after Thanksgiving in 2009. James Craig Kaler and his wife, Karen, both had successful careers in Weatherford, Texas, and three children, two daughters and a son. Though they seemed like the perfect family from the outside, trouble was brewing behind closed doors. After James allegedly shoved Karen during an argument, she filed for divorce in January of 2009, and she and her children moved out. Then on November 28th of that same year, Karen and the kids were at her sister's house, along with Karen's grandmother, 89-year-old Dorothy White, for a family Thanksgiving weekend celebration, which should have been a great day, turned into peril when James showed up and opened fire on Karen, his daughters, 18-year-old Emily and 16-year-old Lauren, and the elderly Dorothy. He spared his son's life. Emily died at the scene, but Lauren and Dorothy survived long enough to tell officials that it was James who shot them. Lauren and Karen died that night, and Dorothy passed away a few days later. James was arrested on November 29th for capital murder. He was convicted in August of 2011, and two months later, a judge sentenced him to death. James and his attorneys appealed the conviction because Kansas law does not allow defendants to plead guilty by reason of insanity. Instead, Kansas law states that someone with mental illness could not have intended to commit a crime. The appeals court in Kansas upheld his conviction and his argument made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. The highest court in the land, however, upheld the conviction. Now let's take a look back at the case that took away the lives of three generations of women. A family's peaceful holiday gathering is suddenly crashed by a murderous maniac with an assault rifle. And a frantic emergency operator hears the unspeakable horror unfolding at Grandma's house. Forever saying to myself, you know, what the hell? How many more could there possibly be? This shocking tragedy would wipe out all but two members of what was regarded as the perfect all-American family by friends and neighbors in Weatherford, Texas, a quiet bedroom community of Fort Worth. They were something else in their little town. Where Craig Kaler, an accomplished engineer, was the town's utility director. It was a not only well-paying job, but a well-respected position within the community. Craig and Karen were also the proud parents of two beautiful teenage daughters, Emily and Lauren, and a toddler named Sean. Emily was the firstborn, and she was a smart kid, a pleaser, wanted to do good, kind of like her mom, creative and smart. So was younger sister Lauren, but in a different way, says their Aunt Lynn, Karen's younger sister. She was kind of silly, more of a creative, outside the box kind of a thinker. The pair had combined their talents to become the leaders of an all-girl band that made them local stars like their mom and dad. Emily played the drum set and sang, and Lauren played the bass and sang. And with their beautiful home and all the other trappings of wealth and success, the Kaler family was living the dream. But Lynn says that although Craig and Karen appeared to be still in love after more than 20 years of marriage, behind closed doors, they had hit some bumps in the road. Relationship-wise, with between the two of them, it was just not going well. Lynn says she had learned that Craig had become obsessively controlling, right down to limiting Karen to an allowance and even setting the precise time they would have sex each night. If she didn't do what he wanted, bedtime at nine, she would, quote, pay for it. But Lynn says Karen continued to cater to Craig's demands to keep peace in the family. She found it just easier to go along with, okay, he expects this, so I might as well just do it, so I don't have to pay for it later. That is, until Karen found someone who treated her a whole lot better. Another woman, Sonny Reese, 
A beautiful fellow fitness instructor Karen had met and fallen for at the gym where they both worked. My theory is Karen was so beaten down for so long. Finally, somebody took an interest in her in a positive way and treated her well. Karen and Sonny are said to have become so inseparable that Karen told Craig about their affair. And her husband reportedly not only approved of it, but actually encouraged Karen to continue seeing Sonny. I kind of had a thought in mind of the three of them having been involved in a, a threesome type of situation. Until Craig found himself the odd man out. It seems like it kind of backfired on him. As it became obvious that uh, Karen and Sonny were both interested in each other and not in him, and kind of started pushing him out of the picture, then he became extremely jealous of that relationship. So jealous, allegedly, that Craig took a new, even higher paying government job in Columbia, Missouri, and moved Karen and their daughters into an even nicer home there just to get his wife away from his love rival, Sonny. He basically thought that moving the family away, getting them to another town, that they'd go back to having the perfect life. But within a year, Karen files for divorce, takes her daughters, and returns to girlfriend Sonny. He didn't know how to handle that. And then it happens. As Karen and the kids are visiting her grandmother, 89-year-old Dorothy White at her farm on Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> the grandmother calls her emergency alert service, saying a gunman has just burst into her home, firing at anything that moves. The alarmed operator can hear gunfire in the background. Sheriff's Deputy Nathan Perling is the first to arrive at the crime scene to find the grandmother in the kitchen, still alive but bleeding to death from multiple gunshot wounds. Our forearm, her abdomen, uh, the amount of blood, that there wasn't anything that I could do for her at that moment. Deputy Perling follows a trail of blood and shell casings into the dining room, where he finds Grandma White's granddaughter, Karen, also riddled with bullets. And apparently dead. She was on the floor on her back. She didn't look like she was breathing or had a pulse. As he continues through the house, Deputy Perling finds Emily also apparently dead in the living room. She had been shot once in the chest. She either was hiding or fell behind the couch in the coffee table. It's like the deputy has walked into a waking nightmare. I remember saying to myself, you know, what the hell? How many more could there possibly be? And then something eerie gets his attention. I heard this voice, very faint, um, very uh, disturbing, I guess is the word I would use, um, pleading, help me, help me. Uh, I don't want to die. The deputy follows the voice up the stairs to find Karen's youngest daughter, 16-year-old Lauren, shot in the back and bleeding to death from her bullet wounds. Her lower right side was turning purple as I was watching it, so I could see the blood pooling up internally. But Lauren was still desperately clinging to life and still talking. Her last words recorded by Deputy Perling. Hold up, don't move. Don't there. I know, don't move. I don't wanna die. I'm gonna take care of you, okay? Make me alive. Cops had arrived at Grandma Wright's home to find a little farmhouse of unimaginable horror. Her 18-year-old great-granddaughter was already dead. And the teenager's mother, 44-year-old Karen, had also been killed in a horrifying Thanksgiving holiday massacre. But 89-year-old grandmother Dorothy was still alive, as was Emily's younger sister, Lauren, who was 16. I don't want to die! Who did this to you? And with her dying breath, Lauren tells Deputy Sheriff Nathan Perling the identity of the man who shot the entire family. She told me, Craig. And I said, who's Craig? And she said, my dad. The deputy could hardly believe his own ears. And she was very clear. And so at that moment, I put out the, I put out the dispatch who we were looking for, uh, who had done this. And then I just held her. 
until medics arrived and rushed Lauren to a hospital where the heroic teen would be declared dead soon after arrival. She was amazing. Um, I can't imagine the level of pain that she was in emotionally and physically. Grandma Wright would also identify Craig Keeler as the gunman before dying several days later. And as heartbreaking as it is, Craig and Karen's little boy, Sean, just 10 years old, would point the finger at his father. Did he watch his dad come in the back door and shoot his mom? Before fleeing to the safety of a neighbor's home. We all believe that, yes, absolutely, the son was intentionally spared. And investigators would learn why after capturing Craig the morning after the massacre when someone spotted the fugitive father abandoning his truck and running down a quiet road in the woods. I believe there's somebody back here. And 46-year-old Craig Keeler would surrender peacefully to a sheriff's deputy who responded to the 911 call. He pulled up to him and rolled his window down and the individual said, on the, on the man you're looking for. This doesn't look really very good, as you, I'm sure, can well understand. I understand. And uh, I missed it. I missed it. Keeler refuses to talk to detectives at the station about the day of his family's massacre, but he speaks openly about the events leading up to it. Well, obviously it's the sunny connection. Admitting that he was hurt and angry when his wife Karen left him for another woman. A fellow fitness instructor, Sonny Reese, and then filed for divorce. I was having a hard time with the whole situation. Kaler says he was agreeable to Karen having a relationship with Sonny in the beginning. I said, you know, I'm just so happy. I, you know, if there's something you wanted to try, just, just don't want to lose you in the process. Just be careful. Right. I was trying to be a, trying to be nice about it. So what happened? I mean, it just, it just became just a relationship that took over. Kaler says Karen's affair with Sonny continued even after he moved the family from Texas to Missouri in the hope of breaking them up and winning back his wife. She'd fly down there, Sonny fly up here. And Kaler says he was furious when he learned Karen was allegedly taking the kids with her when she visited Sonny. The kids told me that they stayed in a hotel room. And Sonny was there, obviously. He says he also felt humiliated when Karen and Sonny came out by flaunting their relationship at a New Year's Eve party attended by some of his friends. They were sitting together and rubbing each other's leg and I mean just, just making a spectacle and then it just got out of control. And Sonny had apparently enraged Kaler when she sent him this text reading in part, she's only staying with you because she believes that right now it's this for the kids. She doesn't love you, Craig. And he tells detectives Karen only rubbed salt in the wounds. She had him arrested on domestic violence charges for hugging her against her wishes while they were still married. Yeah, that's when she moved down. Andy says that arrest, along with the divorce and the toll it took on his work performance, had cost him his job with the city. And he was arrested right outside the city council meeting. It was horribly embarrassing to him. I understood that you were making quite a bit of money there, too, which is over 150000 a year. Taylor says he lost even more money when Karen allegedly cleaned out their $50,000 joint bank account. And he was ordered to pay more than $3,000 a month in child support. Everything just unraveled. It's just unbelievable. So he lost his wife, his children, his job, and was living back home with his parents at that point. Kaler tells detectives he even lost the affection of his daughters. They sided with mom Karen after she filed for divorce. Were they angry with you? I don't know if they were angry. Were you angry at them? Well, I wasn't angry and frustrated sometimes. He was upset with them for condoning the mother's relationship that he didn't approve of. And investigators suspect that's why Kaler murdered the two teenagers, as well as her mother Karen and grandmother Dorothy, when his rage finally exploded in that massacre. It's our belief that he went there with all intention of killing uh, Karen and, her, and the two daughters. Prosecutor Brandon Jones also believes Kaler spared the life of his son Sean because he remained close to his father, and at 10 was too young to understand what was going on between his parents. 
he shot mom deliberately and then intentionally moved on past the son and allowed the son to run out. We believe that his son was his buddy. He liked his son. And ironically, as the only survivor of the massacre, young Sean would be the star witness for the prosecution at his father's murder trial. Sean obviously identified his dad as being the one who walked in and shot his mom. For a boy to get up there, the weight of the world on his shoulders and testify. Extremely tough for him. I think he was proud that Sean was up there testifying, that he was, had the ability to do that. And Craig Kaler, who had pleaded not guilty by reason of mental illness, would be convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. There was never remorse, never sadness. It was almost a sense of accomplishment. Uh, he was proud of what he did. There was certainly no tears shed by Craig Kaler in court. Fully convinced in his own twisted mind, says Prosecutor Jones, that he righteously delivered his son from the clutches of his mother and her lover, Sonny Reese. He's written letters to me from death row and to other people. He feels that he did it for his son. That's, I think, how he can live with himself, is that he did this to free Sean. Which doesn't make any sense to family members left mourning the loss of four loved ones at the murderous hands of Craig Kaler. I'm not saying he's insane, but not a, a person who's got all their brain faculties wouldn't kill somebody, period. After sentencing, Craig Kaler added one final insult while walking out of court, yelling to his mother and father, quote, take care of Sean so he's not raised by a bunch of freaks. After going into the foster system, Sean would eventually live with Craig's parents. He's now graduated high school and works in Kansas.